Hi, this is Pastor Sherry, and I just wanted to share with you、uh, a message that I got to share at my church this week. Enjoy. I just love to dive into the Word. How many of you just love to just spend time in the Word? That's what we're here for. And so I'm kind of, I have a lot of scripture today. So get your Bibles ready, your Bible apps, whatever you have.、Um, today,、um, I've been nibbling on this for a while.、Um, I'm out of my comfort zone today. I'm a jeans and a t shirt kind of person. And yet, I've got a dress on that I've had hanging in my closet for probably th- three years. <laughs> Tried it on, took it home. It's so pretty. Put it in the closet, didn't wear it again. Because it's, it's, it's not me. I feel like an imposter when I'm wearing something that I'm not comfortable in. And yet, maybe I'm not an imposter. Maybe it's just the Lord stretching me, right? So today, we're going to kind of talk about that. Today, the title of my message is To Tell the Truth. So, to tell the truth, I'm less comfortable standing up here this morning in this than I would be if I just had on my jeans. But that's okay because we're being stretched. Who remembers the game show entitled To Tell the Truth? It was an amazing little black and white show. There's a new one too, but I have to admit, I can't watch that one as much because it gets a little risky. But the old black and white one was cute and adorable. It, it, it had its moments, but it was. Cleaner than now. But、um, it's a classic game show in which a person of some notoriety and two imposters try to match wits with a panel of four celebrities. The object of the game is to try to fool the celebrities into voting for the two imposters. Each wrong vote would be worth $250. One of these people is an imposter. If you'll go ahead and show the video. Okay. All right, Tom. May we、uh, see the result of your deliberation? I voted for number two. I, I thought it was、um, uh, sort of the perfect arrangement. He sells these geese to cotton farmers in the spring, buys them back from them in the fall, and processes them for marketing and eating. I, that's great. You can't beat that for a business. <laughs> Sheila, may we see your vote? I voted for number two, not for the same reason. I voted because he looked like a man who had great patience that it must take to find the certain geese that can eat weeds. All right. Orson, your decision, please. I agree with Tom. I think it's a short, happy life providing you like weeds. And、uh, number three had a lot of information, but on、uh, hunch, I go for number two. And Kitty. I voted for number two. Oh! <laughs> Well, number three gave marvelous answers. Number one said a female uh, a goose was.、Uh, I think we got that wrong somehow, but maybe you misunderstood me. Anyway, I voted for number three, too, because he said when we process them and they go to the market, it all sounds as though he knew his onions, his geese. So、uh, they have all made up their minds and they've all voted for number two. They're all smiling, Gene. I don't like <laughs> Well, we'll find out right now which one of these three gentlemen is the real breeder of weeder geese. So, we'll Will the real Fred Cervinka please stand up?、Ah. <laughs> Panel, you are absolutely superb in that.、Uh, may I point out that Fred Cervinka raises his weeder geese at the heart of Missouri Poultry Farm and Hatchery. That's the place where he does this sort of thing. All right, now, number one, will you tell us who you really are? I'm Jim McDowell, executive sports editor of the Trenton Times newspaper in Trenton, New Jersey.、Oh. <laughs> and number three, how about you? I am Clarence Nash, the original and only voice of Donald Duck.、Oh. We've been doing this for 30 years, and this is the man who owns the voice that you've been wondering about for 30 years. And、uh, Clarence, tell us this、uh, does Donald Duck like weeds? I'm going to do it. He what? I'm going to do it. 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 I'm going to do it.
Well, I thank you very much, uh, Clarence, for being with us tonight, and it's a pleasure to meet you at uh, long last. And gentlemen, uh, we thank all three of you. Uh, there were no incorrect votes. However, you do get $150, and the carton of Winston cigarettes will be waiting for you on the way out. Thanks very much for being our guest tonight. It was definitely a different era, wasn't it? But it, but it shows. They knew the real man. Because of what, they, what he spoke, how he spoke, the passion he spoke of it, they knew who the real man was. They didn't vote for the imposters. And so what is an imposter? An imposter is a person who pretends to be someone else in order to deceive others, especially for fraudulent gain. Who among us are imposters? To a point this morning, I'm standing before you as an imposter. Because this is not how I would normally dress. This is not how I'm most comfortable. See, an imposter sometimes we think is this big lie. Sometimes it's the little ones. So today, we're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to read a lot of scripture, like I said, because in the time of Jesus, many thought he was an imposter of sorts. Many expected a savior to come and to save them, clean up everything, change all the rules, and that's just not who Jesus was. He came in gentle and loving and kind. He didn't come in to change anything. He came to fulfill and people were misunderstanding what he was doing. And they really thought he was an imposter. So let's start reading today in John 6, 25 through 59. It's, it's, a, it's a lot. But gosh, there's so much good in it. Um, we're going to nibble on it a bit today. So John 6, 25 says, And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do? that we may work the works of God. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna of the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I'm going to stop there for a minute because... He's trying to explain to them, you know, they're saying, okay, you know, we've seen these different things, so do another trick. I mean, really, in a sense, he's like, okay, what you've done was fun, so what else can you do? Instead of understanding who he truly was, and that he was really there to heal and restore. But they're like, it's just a parlor trick. What else do you have for us today? They just didn't understand at all. 
And I want to bring our attention back to verse 30 through 33. What sign will you perform? And then he gave them the bread to eat. He's talking about Moses. They're believing in Moses. Instead of believing that the Lord was the one that gave them food. How many times in our lives do we sit and think, okay, where did that really come from? I'm giving glory to the doctor for healing me. I'm giving glory to the bank for giving me money. I'm giving glory to, but who am I really supposed to be giving glory to? Do I trust in the Lord? Do I give praise to the Lord? Or do I sit and think, well, Moses gave him. Moses gave it to them. And so I just wonder sometimes, am I, am I looking at the right place when my food, my finances, my blessings come? Let's keep reading in verse 41. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. He says, at the last day. They're totally misunderstanding. They don't know what he's talking about. And now this is twice now. He said, at the last day. 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven, and if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Again, they're going, I just don't get it. This is Mary and Joseph's boy. Who is he to give me these things? He doesn't know what he's talking about. Verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Again, he's explaining of the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds me, feeds, I'm sorry, feeds on me, will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Pastor talked about this on Sunday. Funny how his scriptures and what he's teaching on Sunday went right along with what I wrote three months ago. The Lord's up to something. He's trying to show us something. When he starts repeating things, it's because we're not listening. We're not getting it. We have to get this. He is the bread of life. He's trying to explain to them, and he grosses them out. You'll eat my flesh. You'll drink my blood. He kind of grosses them out. 
And they're like, mm, I don't think so. It doesn't make any sense to me. And th- th- this, it, none of this makes sense. How can I follow you? And many didn't after this. Even his disciples, who had seen miracles right before their eyes, thought he was an imposter. They did not truly know him or understand what he was trying to tell them. If we back up just a bit to John 6, 1, they're right there when he feeds the 5,000. John 6, 16, Jesus walks on water. These are not parlor tricks. Something up my sleeve. It, it's just, it's not that way. He's trying to explain to them the truth of who he is and why he's there. And they're missing it. I, I think sometimes I'd be like, what else do I need to do? I've done all these tricks and you still don't understand. In your eyes, they're tricks. Then John 6.25 where we just read our opening scriptures, he's trying again to explain to them who he is and why he's there and who sent him. I think the thing we miss sometimes is who sent him. His father God sent him for us. And I think sometimes I take that for granted and I think sometimes even today, I wonder. There's times when I'm questioning, God, really? (laughs) Really, God? I have to endure this? Father, you're so good. You've healed me before. You've done this before. Why do I have to walk this out? But sometimes he says you have to walk that out to, to believe it, to build your faith, to know and understand in who I am. I think, I hope, I pray that I would trust and know and believe. But standing before you today, I'm an imposter because there's times I can say, I'm really not sure. To tell the truth, (laughs) if they put me on a panel, I don't know. I would hope that by seeing the signs, by hearing his word, by following him, I would know that I know. They watched him and didn't know. So it makes me wonder sometimes, how would I? His own country did not believe. Mark Mark 6, 1 through 6. Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this, which I which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work here except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Again, they were offended. This is twice now, two, two separate scriptures. Are you offended? Yes, <laughs> they were offended. They had no clue what he was talking about. And again, his own country, his own town. How many of us are nervous to go into a store and pray over somebody because we're in our own town. People know us. People know me. Or at least, let's say it this way, people think they know me. Sometimes people think they know us. Do they really? When push comes to shove, when hard hard times come, do you really know the people in your life? Do you question that? If I'm having a hard time, who can I depend on? Who's really my friend? Who's really my family? Sometimes I think we question that. Sometimes I've told people things and they really weren't my friend. (laughs) 
And so I wonder, how hard was it for them in their, his, his own town? It's like, I know who you are. I watched you grow up. I watched you play. I heard what you said. And now you want me to think that you're the son of God? But unlike me, he really was holy. He truly was the person he said he was. And he walked in no sin. Just like the TV game show, I don't think any of the people we put on the panel would vote for him. Do you? If we had put him on that panel and we had disciples and we had people from the community come and sit on that panel, do you think any of them would have known and voted for him? I mean, that man that was not the imposter, they didn't win any money because they knew for sure which man he was. How many of them would know? How many of them would just do it for gain? Do we do that? I come to church, I feel the seat, I pray, gain. I want my gain. I did my chore for the week, right? I want my gain. And the Lord's going, but do we have a relationship? Do I know you? Do you know me? Are you in my word? Do you know me? Sometimes even I think, I don't know that I do, Lord. I don't know that I do. I hope I do. Is that going to get me in heaven? Well, that's not a salvation issue. But am I expecting gain and treating him like an imposter instead of getting to know him for who he really is and for the benefits he truly has given me? Or am I just taking it for granted? He went on a cross for me. He has saved my life many times. I wouldn't be standing here today if he hadn't, literally. But do I give him the glory in that? Do we? So I think at some point they were like, will the real Messiah please stand up? Because you're not it. You know, I mean, I think sometimes they were like, who is he? Because it's not him. They were expecting some strong guy. They were expecting some, I don't know. I mean, there's scripture in here that that says, well, it can't be him, you know, because he doesn't fit the outward appearance that I think he should be. He doesn't have the personality. He doesn't have the the strength. He doesn't have the, I don't know, but, but that's not him. And so I just wonder. But then the Lord took me to John 1, 43 through 51. And it says, The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Come, can anything good come of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. In whom is no deceit. He can't be the imposter. Can't be the imposter. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon son of man. Because he believed and he saw there was no deceit. He knew him. He knew him and believed. I don't understand why it was so hard for the others to not do the same. 
So it made me question, why do some people believe, and that's all it takes, and then there's some of us, we need more than that. Is that a trust issue? Is that a love issue? Is that on my side or his? So it makes me wonder. All these questions have been coming up. I've been dealing with some stuff. Not that I'm questioning God, but I'm questioning, I thought I paid that penance. I thought I, I, thought I was redeemed of that, Lord. I thought that once I repented and I changed my life that I would have no more residue of a past. Guess what? Sometimes there's residue. But guess what? It's not for the reason that I was thinking. Stuff may be coming back up to glorify God. Because I did save you. Because I have healed you. Because you have been obedient and you have stepped out in what I've called you to do. It's not to say you didn't. It's to say, look at what we've done. And now walk this out to show even more faith and more trust and more understanding in me. Not because you've done anything wrong, not because anything's being drudged, but because we're moving forward in the last little bit of the healing. Receive that. Receive that. So let's, let's look at John 4, 21 through 28. We know this scripture, woman at the well. I'm just going to pull out part of it here. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I, who speak to you, am he. And she believed. And not only did she believe, she ran back because he told her everything about her that she had hidden that it was a secret. And she ran back. I, I think she was kind of the first missionary, maybe. I, I don't know. She ran back to her, and, and they all believed. Now, let's think about that for a minute. This woman that nobody liked, they knew her history, and because she believed and ran back, they believed. Why would they do that? They didn't even like this woman. They knew who she was. But they believed. Not only did they believe, but then they turned their life around and gave their heart to God, and now they're praising him. I think that's how we should be. Otherwise, we're an imposter. We don't believe. We enjoy these scriptures, but do we believe them and live a life accordingly? What life are we living? Some days I'm an imposter, to tell you the truth. Some days I'm an imposter. I, I can be honest with you, I don't know how I got a title above my name. There are days I think, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. Why would you do that? If you only knew what I did, if you only knew how I thought, if you only knew... But he does. He does. He knows your hearts. He knows who he created you to be. He also knows our weaknesses. He also knows our strengths. He knows what we're going to come up against because he knew our life before we were even created. And we forget that. He knew I was going to take a right turn instead of following the path. He knew that. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Where's she going to go? Darn. Okay. Took the right instead of walking straight. But he knows that, and he's hoping he's praying. I think he prays and sings over me. The Bible says he sings over me. And 
And I know, just like we do, if you have children, you're like, no, 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 no. Okay, here we go again. Okay, well, that's all right. Let's give them another opportunity. Let's give them another chance. Let's, let's put someone else in their place so that they can get it and they can understand. Let's do that again. Because he wants us to be healed and whole. He wants us to be saved. So he gives us another opportunity. Time and time again, he loves us so much, he gives us an opportunity. 2 Corinthians 6, 3 through 10 is very encouraging to me. It says, we give no offense. And I have it bold on my paper. I give no offense. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. All of you, all of you are ministers of God. You don't need a title above your name. You don't need any fancy teaching. You're all ministers of God. If you read your Bible and you trust in the word, you're a minister of God. Walk as a minister of God. You don't have to be perfect to do it. Just walk in it. It'll get better. It'll get easier. It really will. It does. So, oh, hold on. So it says, but in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true as unknown and yet well known as dying and behold we live as chastened and yet not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things my next title says be holy O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. By your own affections. So I was, I was chewing on this. That last little bit really got me. And so I read in a commentary, the Barnes notes on the Bible. I, I read that a lot. It's really interesting. I would, I would highly recommend that. It says, in everything he did, Paul always considered what his actions communicated about Jesus Christ. If you are a believer, you are a minister of God. In the course of each day, non-Christians observe you. Don't let your careless or undisciplined actions be another person's excuse for rejecting God. Gosh, that's a big thing. Gosh, that's a big thing. I can't let my actions... Let somebody else think that God is not good. So it, it, to me, everybody knows my husband. My husband's an amazing man. I wouldn't do what I do without him. He's my covering. He's my prayer. It's not that I need permission, but he's the head of my house. And so I look to him, hey, is this what we are going to do? It's not me. I'm not up here doing this. This is my husband, me, my family, my kids, my grandkids. It's us doing ministry. I just get the microphone. But what if, what if I stood up here and I preached to you about the gospel and how good God is. And then I went outside, opened a can of beer and lit a cigarette. And then on the way to the car, I started yelling and screaming at my husband about how stupid he is. That was rude. You didn't, su- you didn't support me this time. And what's the matter with you? And then I'm yelling at my kids and my grandkids. What would y'all think then? But we do it in the grocery store. We do it at school. We do it at work. We do it at... People are watching us. 
I, I need to be accountable. Not because I hold the microphone. <laughs> Let me just make that clear. Not because I hold the microphone, but because I am a child of God. I've been baptized and I confess with my mouth that I am a child of God. So then it's my flesh may want, I used to drink a lot, never smoked, but anyway, side note. But I don't any longer want that. There was a day that that's all I wanted. It came above everything else. But when it was gone and I put God first, it was gone. I don't think of it. I don't, it's, ugh, I don't, I don't even. It's not an issue because God is above that. I relinquished it and I don't look back. But what if, what if some days I think I just can't do this anymore and this is more than I can handle I get something from the doctor. I, um, I don't know. Something that's tragic to me. Where do I turn? Do I turn to what I used to turn to in my past? Do I turn to God? This is when that little line comes, am I an imposter or am I truly a child of God? Do I really believe what the Lord has done for me? Or do I just think it was great then? He can't do it again. He can do it again. He does it again. He does it every day. He does it every minute of every day for me. When I seek him, he does it. And with his strength, I don't look back. Sometimes I wonder... In my old life, there were people that I hurt and I said things to and I gossiped and I did all these things. You know, it's one of those that I make amends, right? Not because I need to look good, but because the Lord calls us to that. Do I apologize? Do I make right what I made wrong? We need to, we need to be accountable. I find myself questioning, am I an imposter? Do I walk in the fruits of the Spirit, kindness, gentleness, love, patience? Do I do that? So then there's days where, will the real Sherry Lane please stand up? Because today I don't know who I am. I'm cranky, I'm tired, my body hurts, and I'm not being very kind. <laughs> Is that the real Sherry? Is that when I stand up? Or do I relinqu relinquish that to God and apologize to the people I was just cranky to and then get on my knees and repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness? Is that the real Sherry? We do it daily. It's, I'm going to say it's okay because we're not perfect. But in our imperfection, we should be able to get on our knees, humble ourselves before God and say, I messed up. Even if I didn't fully mess up, I know it's okay for me to say I'm sorry. So today, just going to read one last scripture, Titus 2.11-15. Mine says, well, if I can get my glasses on, trained by saving grace. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. That's us. Zealous for good, work, for good works. That's us, his own people. So now I, I ask, will the real Christian please stand up? Yeah, some days are hard. But if you're in this building and you have read your Bible, 
then you're a real, you're a real Christian. Are you Christ-like? To the best of your ability on any given day, are you Christ-like? Do you forgive when you need to forgive? Do you apologize when you need to apologize? And are you genuine when you, when you do apologize? So seriously, will the real Christian please stand up? Because you are, and I am. We may have had troubles in our life. We may have blown it yesterday or earlier today or whenever, but we're still a child of God. We still believe, we still understand, we still reach out to him. So we have every right to stand up. We're not imposters. But I I would ask this morning that if there is something in your life that you're like, you know what, in that area, sometimes I feel like an imposter. Will you give that to God today? Will you change that? Not, not to show me, the people around you, not, not to cement it in you, but so that you can tell God. I recognize that in that area, I'm an imposter. I don't want to be an imposter anymore. I want to be comfortable in what you've given me, Lord. I want to be comfortable in what you've called me to. I want to humble myself and apologize when I've been wrong. I want to be a strong person that says, I may not be wrong, but I love you, and so I'm going to say I'm sorry, and I'm going to genuinely mean that I am sorry that we had this. What can I do to fix it? There's no harm in that. Jesus did that. So today, if you all close your eyes... I would just ask that if you have struggled with anything that you think maybe I'm an imposter, I would just ask that you'd raise your hand and just give it to God. Lord, I'm giving this to you today. I've got my hand raised. Lord, I'm giving this to you today. I don't want to be an imposter in this anymore. Lord, this is not who I am. Lord, this is not who you've called me to be. And Lord, I'm trusting you with that. I'm opening my hand and I'm giving it to you today. And I am not going to take it back. I'm going to relinquish it to you. And I'm going to ask, Lord, that you will give me strength and wisdom that you'll stop me before I open my mouth, that you will humble me and I will be able to apologize, that, Lord, if I am giving you something of substance, that, Lord, I will not take it back. Lord, I thank you today that I am not an imposter. I am a child of God. I am redeemed of God, and I am your child. And Lord, there is nothing that will separate me from you. And so, Lord, today, I give you this. And every day, I will give you this. Because it is not who I am. So, Lord, today, we just thank you and we praise you for the works that you have done. We believe in what you have done. We thank you for going and dying on the cross for us. Lord, for us. We cannot thank you enough. Father, hear our hearts today. No words can say thank you for what you have done for us. Lord, you're so good. So good. And you love so well. Lord, we pray strength and we pray endurance. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for every good thing today. In Jesus' name, amen.